Uh, e tua ke au ki te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, uh, ngā mihi, ngā mihi, ngā mihi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia rama tātou katoa. Um, now, first step, figure out if this baby works. Yo! Um, I, first and foremost, I want to say I'm really pleased to be able to speak with Dennis because we've known each other for a few na years now doing research in very similar areas around the development of our, our communities and our people. So, first and foremost, ngā mihi tu uh, ehoa because uh, always good to catch up with Den. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about um, the title I've given to the presentation today is Emancipatory Māori Entrepreneurship, which first and foremost is a hell of a lot of syllables, but anyway. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, the paper has essentially come out of some research I've been doing in recent years uh, towards my PhD. But first and foremost, ngā mihi, um, I come from um, he, he uri o muri whenua ahau, I come from north of Ngāpohi. Ngāti kauki whāngaroa, te rāroa i te tahau tōku pāpa, ngāti kuri i te tahau tōku uh, māma. Engari, he urban Māori in INA, so I'm sure you all got that. <laughs> um, I'm a senior lecturer in Māori development at Te Arapotama in the Faculty of Māori Development and we're very proud at AUT to have a faculty devoted entirely to Māori development and I'm proud to be part of it. And as I said, I'm currently, uh, and I mean currently, uh, completing my PhD which is looking at Māori entrepreneurship. Um, so the, the, the essential cope of, of what I want to do today is to present a very brief overview of my PhD, which is a study uh, of a sample of Māori entrepreneurs who own screen production companies. And I've picked this group of people because uh, there are only about 20 or 30 of them at any given time who own Māori independent production companies that produce a significant, i.e. more than a million dollars worth of work in a calendar year for film and television. And so that makes them very interesting. And I know the focus of the conference here is around social enterprise, but I argue throughout all of my work that a Māori entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur who happens to be Māori, but a Māori entrepreneur is a social entrepreneur because their enterprise delivers more than just economic benefits to individuals, but also to their whānau, whānui, their community of interest. So that's the reason why I've, I've, I've really essentially argued that this is a form of emancipatory entrepreneurship. But I want to take you on that little journey as we progress. Um, it analyzes, the study analyzes the reasons why they started their companies and also it explores the links between who they are as individuals, the way their careers have evolved and how and why they've gone into what is essentially a very fraught area, as all of you who have started a business know, particularly in a small economy like ours, what has encouraged them to take the ball by the horns, as it were, and, and set themselves up as a production company. So that was basically uh, the research that I've been engaged in for the last three years. And as any good researcher, there is a body of literature, a body of research that has helped shape and inform my thinking. And I want to share a little bit of that with you because it's helped me to understand this topic and I think it's, it's useful to reflect on what other people have found out around this area. So there's this fabulous woman, I don't know how many of you uh, know Carla Hokamo, who, who did her PhD in 2007 about Māori identity. And one of the things that she found, which I think is particularly um, useful to my research, is that she looked at the role of positive ethnic identity as a means of affirming social worth and the impact that knowledge or one's knowledge of one's cultural identity has on well-being, self-esteem and self-efficacy. And uh, I don't know how many of you come from ethnic minorities, but I'm sure that those of you who do will understand how difficult it is, uh, and it's not just ethnic minorities or any minority group, really, how, how difficult it is to maintain your sense of self-worth in a society that's dominated by another set of cultural values and assumptions. So often, self-esteem and self-efficacy are the first victims of minority status. And so what she did was look at Māori identity in that context and I think has made a wonderful contribution to the body of New Zealand literature as well as my own research. I've also been looking at the uh, careers because I think um, careers is a, it tends to be a quite Eurocentric notion. I'm, I mean I'm you know barking at 60 and I only found out I had a career five years ago. <laughs> I've always espoused the theory that if you hang around a university long enough, they will give you a job. 
and I've been loitering with intent for 25 years now, so, you know. I am actually what's known as a tertiary tart. I've gone from Auckland University to AUT, back to Auckland University, out to Unitech, and now I'm back at AUT. I'll go anywhere they give me a car park, quite frankly. Um, so it was quite refreshing to find out that I actually had a career. Um, but, but one of the things that I've found interesting about the careers literature is that actually informs the, the wonderful trajectory that as we look back on it, we reflect and call our work life. And Arthur et al, um, career theorists, have looked at uh, careers as the way that all workers use their accumulated resources to enact their careers upon the surrounding environment. And I think this is particularly important for Māori's screen industry which is the field that I've been studying, because uh, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as a Māori screen industry. You know, 30 years ago, um, if you were lucky, you got to see a Māori face. Well, if you were Māori, you thought you were lucky. Maybe if you weren't Māori, you didn't think you were lucky. But if you were Māori, you would kind of jump up and down with joy because you saw a Māori face on television that wasn't in a headlock being dragged off to the cells. <laughs> Uh, although only four years ago the CEO of TVNZ said Police 10-7 was Māori television because there were so many Māori on it. <laughs> I'd like to think we've come some way since then. So, so what has happened over the last 20 years of Māori participation in the creative screen sector in this country is that individual Māori have enacted their careers. They have literally created careers which did not exist 20 years ago, and, and therefore those enacted careers have also enacted the environment itself. We now have something that is called the Māori screen industry, where only 10 years ago we did not have a Māori screen industry. So individuals have enacted careers and enacted an industry, and that industry is delivering far more than just individual wealth to individual Māori. It is revitalising language, culture, telling stories in an authentic way. So it's contributing in all sorts of ways to New Zealand society. Um, I talked earlier about self-efficacy, and that's something that I've learned a lot more about in the last five years that I've been involved in this research than I did five years ago. I um, wasn't even quite sure what self-efficacy was five years ago. Now I can talk about it at length. I won't today. It'll bore you. However, interesting piece of research that found there's a positive correlation between self-efficacy and the decision to start a business. Now, this is not rocket science. It, it took till 2001 for somebody to prove this theoretically, that when you feel good about yourself, <laughs> you're going to go and start a business. Yo. Um, however, very useful for my research purposes. Um, and coming out of some of the other literature I've been looking at is uh, some more recent work on Indigenous entrepreneurship. And I refer here uh, to a study done by Pareto et al., um, a group of Indigenous entrepreneurs who found that, and this is where we're kind of zeroing in on what I'm really interested in, that the second wave of Indigenous development after direct economic assistance from outside, the second wave, so the first wave is getting us up out of the, the, the slush pond with handouts and charity and all that stuff that makes you feel really good when you're able to give it, but just makes us feel like shit. The second wave after that lies in indigenous efforts to rebuild our nations and improve our lot through entrepreneurial enterprise, which is kind of just getting to the point where my research started. I'd also done some work on Indigenous entrepreneurship um, a few years back and wrote a paper where I started trying to look at what Indigenous or what Māori entrepreneurship looks like and the, the title I've tentatively given it is Kaupapa Māori Entrepreneurship and for me, because we have as a people a long history of entrepreneurial endeavour, uh, you know, if you, if you came here in 1828 and you wanted to start a business, you would have to learn to speak Māori. Uh, and, but you could engage as many businesses, down, you know, like the Bank of New Zealand and New Zealand Insurance did really well coming out here in 1843 by having to be part of our community. So, so that was diminished over time and we're now at a point where we are rebuilding that entrepreneurial capacity. And I wanted to look at what does it look like? You know, how do you define it? And so for me, based on the research I did earlier in this last 10 years, I looked at how Māori entrepreneurs, and again I'm making the distinction between Māori entrepreneurs and an entrepreneur who happens to be Māori. That is a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line, but I, I think the more we do research in this field, we do see there is a distinction. 
And so a kaupapa Māori entrepreneur is one who has a sense of commitment to their community. And their community might be whānau, hapu, iwi, or in the case of us urban Māori, Tauraheire, it may be to a, as Waipare to trust to work out here for the community, geographical community. But that commitment is to community and that entrepreneurship and innovation are underpinned by that sense of being for, with and by Māori. And as we build that capacity, we know that we're not saying that that is exclusively with Māori because there are a number of non-Māori partners who have walked alongside our community development that are important to us and our communities. But the underlying philosophy ontology is that what we are doing is for, with and by Māori. And the final piece of work I want to refer to is uh, very recent, last year. Um, O'Neill and Ukbazaran, I hope I'm saying it right, did some really interesting work on uh, entrepreneurship, uh, sustainable entrepreneurship, green entrepreneurs. And I found their work really parallel to my own because they note that entrepreneurship offers a means not only to enact desired entrepreneurial identities, but also to express one's authenticity and inwardly derived values. And for those of you who do work with and in Māori organisations that do reflect a kaupapa Māori philosophy, you will know that those organisations are not just about delivering a good or a service, they are also about projecting a Māori persona and a Māori set of values, tikanga Māori, kaupapa Māori. So that's sort of the, the body of literature that's helped shape my thinking as I went into doing this research. So looking at, um, and I'm not going to go and bore you with the, the methodological framework too much, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell, uh, share here is some of the comments that came to me from the 10 Māori producers that I spoke to as part of my PhD. And what I found is that the things that they said tended to fit into those categories, because those were those all questions I asked, about their identity and their belief in themselves and their desire to start businesses. So I'd like to share with you some of the key quotes that they shared with me. One producer said, the whole thing of storytelling and genealogy was actually instilled in me as a baby. And intergenerational knowledge transfer is fundamental to keeping a culture vital and alive. So in our communities that are broken, in our communities that do not have elders to pass on that knowledge, you find a new generation that does not have that strong sense of who they are and where they come from, their place and the stories that hold together their communities. Uh, another said, I'm a second generation urban born Māori baby of that generation that came to the city for better jobs, as did my family. I arrived here in 1960 to Portage Road in Newland, where Dad worked at the tanneries and Mum worked at the potteries. And, uh, you know, my, my, my life story was supposed to be, like all my sisters, that I'd be up the duff at 17 <laughs> and marry somebody from the factory like, like my mum did. Uh, didn't quite turn out that way. Hey, aha, as we say in the Māori world. Um, but, but certainly my family, like this young woman, uh, this woman, came to the city looking for a new and better life. What Michael King, actually, in his book, called the fantasy contagion. It was, it was a, a fantasy because it wasn't real in many respects, and it was a contagion in that it went through all of our communities like wildfire. I was born uh, in, in Ahipara, in the far, far north, and, uh, and, and basically between 1955 and 1965, Ahipara emptied out and all went to either Te Aratu or Henderson or, New, or Newlyn or Otara or Utahahu. And so we now have grandchildren who are Aucklanders by birth and Northerners by soul. And so, so here we have a mix of those who were raised. So they don't all have the same backgrounds, this little group of people that I spoke to. Another said, I believe I have a place within the, the, within the industry that's vital in the portrayal of a Māori world. And so we see here amongst these producers a recognition that, that what they're doing is not just making films or television. They're actually, they know that they're doing work that's vital in the portrayal of a Māori world. And I love this quote, being Māori to me, means I'm actually here in the Māori world for some reason. So if you have a strong sense of who you are and why you're where you are, you're going to end up doing stuff. Talking about self-efficacy, um, I love this. Uh, we had Māori around us who kept telling us we, we had some stuff. Uh, now, this, this actual producer is uh, a Westie, 
And, and at this point in time, he was talking about, I don't know if she's here or any of her whanau, I hope so, um, June Mariu, who, for those of you who live out west, know that she is a, a pau whenua. She's a, she's a, a centre of our fortunate Western Ma West Auckland Māori community who for 40 years has been telling young Māori they got some stuff. You know, they don't have to be at the bottom of the pile. They're good to go. And people like her are critical to the development of self-efficacy in our communities. Uh, anything's possible. That's my mantra. Now, this is a woman who was brought up in Ōtara. It's not a place where often Māori brought up in Ōtara think, anything's possible, that's my mantra. But she was, again, surrounded by people that made her believe that anything is possible. And that's reflected in the organisation she's created. And I thought, we should rejoice in our bloody talents now. I don't know how many of you know about it in Māori, uh, um, humility, humari, you know, being quiet and dignified while the elephants trample all over us on the road to, to the horizon. Well, this fellow's saying, you know, actually, you know, stop. We should actually be rejoicing in what we're good at. We don't have to apologise when we actually find out we're as good as something as the people around us. And this is, I think, kind of poetic, because he's a poetic producer, this one. When you look at the anatomy of the journey, it was all leading to that path. Happy coincidences, right time, right place, but not afraid to seize the opportunity. Not afraid to seize the opportunity. Critical stuff, that. Because often we are raised to fear seizing opportunity, particularly in minority communities. And then there was that whole notion of self-determination. And, and, and at what point did these people who worked in the industry say, no, nah, I'm going to start my own business? When they started thinking like this, it's best that we make the program and sell it to them rather than them being the big machinery direct dictating to us. We as Māori people need to have control of our own destiny. It was really a very painful experience within mainstream television. You have to compromise all the time. And I realised, actually, you have no power over your stories unless you own them. So this combination of variables is what underpinned these people who went out and took or capitalised on their sense of identity, uh, were underpinned by a sense of self-belief, had a desire for control. And I've, I've, I've put Māori language here to describe these themes. But what I'm saying today is that the outcome is what I call emancipatory entrepreneurship. That is business that delivers emancipation, self-determination and self-control. And so, um, because I like models and I've just learned how to do animation and PowerPoint, I thought I'd zap you with that. <laughs> What I'm arguing is that your sense of identity and your sense of self-belief and your desire for control will result in a form of emancipatory entrepreneurship, which I've labelled wairua oaha, which directly translated means creative spirit. So I'm trying to incorporate creative spirit with entrepreneurial intent in my research. What does that mean in terms of implications? And there are implications for us as community organisations and as communities. How do we enhance Māori identity through revitalisation of language, culture and society? That is a struggle that Māori have been part of for the last 40 years and we've made some progress. The latest report suggesting a ministry of the real, because our language is the heart of our culture. I am standing here speaking to you in English. If my great, great, great grandfather who was a Catholic because of Pompeia and was desperately advocating for us to sign a treaty with the French, I'd be standing here speaking to you in French. I'd probably be prettier. <laughs> We'd all be drinking better coffee. We might be a nuclear dump. But I'd still be here. The fact that we signed the treaty with the English means I'm standing here speaking in English and you're here. So we all own the treaty because it's the reason why we're all here. Nurturing self-efficacy, building self-confidence, risk-taking and opportunity development. When you're Māori and you make a mistake, it's really hard. It's really hard. I, I said a couple of months ago when I was being interviewed on Māori television when the guy who had just ripped off $16 million from Otago got, oh, I don't know, a slap on the back with a wet bus ticket. Based on that kind of uh, justice, then Donna Awatere for $30,000 should have gone to jail for 30 seconds. Anyway, let's move on. I didn't think what she did was right. I just asked for a parity in our justice system.
And how do we enable and empower Māori to engage in activities that deliver self-determination? Now, self-determination for me is not just tinoranga teratanga, which is often equated with political sovereignty. It's also about economic sovereignty. And economic sovereignty is how we really gain sustainable and enduring self-determination so that we can walk together into the sunset as true partners. So that's me. Kia I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Boom. I wasn't sure either. Um, I, I was supposed to actually tell you about the activities that, um, that people had done earlier, and what was their first kind of um, thing that they had organised. And, and Ella's was a march um, against um, the education reforms in 1989. I think she was saying that Phil Goff was actually doing those. So I ran against him and he lost. <laughs> And then um, with Dennis, he was telling me a story about um, how they were selling vegetables uh, as six-year-olds. Uh, the only problem was they were vegetables that they'd borrowed from the neighbours' gardens. <laughs> Please welcome Dennis Vaughan. Kia ora. I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. We saw the non-Indigenous kids, the white kids up the street, having a lemon stand. Uh, lemonade stand, and we thought we'd uh, copy it. Anyway, we ended up in jail, so uh, <laughs> not to worry. The first of many times, no doubt. Um, uh, in my language, Nigaya Wugi, Nigaya Wenga, Margo, Gumada Bienga, Gumada Warangra, Maramurong Tianaganaga, Maramurong Bayalia, Mari Guri Pemu. I acknowledge the spirits of this land and ask permission to walk and talk here, and acknowledge the, uh, the sovereignty of this land. Um, I'm getting feedback. Uh, this is spirits talking to me. Acknowledge the spirits of this land, but also acknowledge uh, elders past and present from both uh, the immigrant and the, um, and the refugee Māori who have come to this land, and also for the Pākehā elders past and present who have worked with Māori. Uh, I always acknowledge that as well. So, uh, go in my language, which is, um, you know, thank you. And uh, thank you for allowing me to work and, and talk in this country. This is my land. It's not the country that you normally see. Uh, my work involves indigenous people within the economy. It's about indigenous entrepreneurship. And however, within the discipline of indigenous entrepreneurship, we are still a marginalised area or marginalised area in academia. Uh, and it's not understood very well. 20 years ago, if I said to you, Māori entrepreneurship here, people would look at me as if I was a smelly person. I had something on my shoe or whatever. Now, if I say I'm involved in doing research, research in Māori entrepreneurship in Aotearoa, people are really interested. It's great. If I say that my academic pursuits is Aboriginal entrepreneurship or Indigenous entrepreneurship in Australia, it's still the same, smelly armpit syndrome. People do not understand those words, Aboriginal and entrepreneurship. New Zealand is starting to be educated. You do accept the two words, but there's something wrong in the English language. However, if I say that I'm involved in qualitative research and economic development of Indigenous people in small business looking at microeconomic reform that allows Aboriginal people to break the welfare cycle and attain self-determination through economic independence, if I'm talking to a politician, a lay person, or anything, they say, this is great, that's really interesting, you know, wow. <laughs> but the word Indigenous and entrepreneurship or Aboriginal and entrepreneurship still, even now in 2011, in Australia, people cannot accept it. However, if I say Māori, it is acceptable. Why? That's the difference in our two countries. 20 years of research, we've gone from being fledgling businesses uh, to Indigenous emancipation for enterprise. And like Ella, I firmly believe that an Indigenous entrepreneur is also involved in social entrepreneurship. The reason being that if you are Aboriginal or you are Māori and you are a successful person, you have a direct impact in a domino pattern on a, between 15 and 25 other people, sometimes more. Uh, and that's where it's really exciting. Indigenous entrepreneurship is fantastic. It also is self-determination because if you are financially independent, you have self-determination. Without financial independence, you do it. You have nothing. Now, this is a paper that was produced just recently by a guy called Robert Fairley, um, and it was submitted to the US Senate Committee on Small Business. And he claims the Great Recession ended in December 2009. He obviously is not a mother with three or four children in the western suburbs of Auckland or the western suburbs of Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane. 
However, he does say some interesting things. Small businesses continue to be hit hard by the sluggish economy. We know that's, that's correct. Uh, bankruptcy rates are up in America. Bankruptcy rates are up in Australia. Contrib contributing to the high rate of business closing, there is the lingering tight credit conditions for small business. For Māori and for Aboriginal business, this is killing us, this tightening up of credit. It is just impossible because it is linked to home equity. And we are all the same, all minority people, we are the same. Our home equity is very, very small, if we have it at all. There's a large body of research that shows that there's limited access to capital hinders formation and growth of minority-owned businesses. Where Māori are different, you have a wonderful social capital and social networking system that allows you to overcome these problems. Aboriginal Australia, we do not. There's substantially lower levels of financial capital invested in the businesses. We know that, which contributes to our failures. And we have fewer employees and, and much, much lower profitable levels in Indigenous businesses. So for Fairley, in his Closing the Gap um, submission to the US Senate, he was correct in a lot of things and it is applicable to our countries. Now what I'm going to talk about the emancipation is 20 years of qualitative research where I've done about 660 formal interviews uh, with Aboriginal entrepreneurs and about 60 formal interviews with Māori and probably about another 60 informal interviews with Māori. So, um, and there is many, many similarities between this work. So to give you those figures gives you an idea of the depth of my, of my formal research, which is probably one of the biggest bodies of, of knowledge on Indigenous entrepreneurship in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, unlike some of my white colleagues who claim to be experts, I'm not an expert, I'm still learning, I will learn to the day I die, um, but it gives you an idea of the background. So what's changed in 20 years? Māori and Aboriginal undertake business by and large within a dominant settler society and that's what we've got to understand because the difference between us and Māori, Māori have this extensive network, this developed social capital, Aboriginal Australia has much less because of the impact of colonisation. Our black feet are left behind. We have to have both feet as white in the white world because our creditors, our debtors, everyone that supplies us or buys from us, 99% of them are non-Indigenous. Therefore, we have to act within this wider world. Uh, Māori are no near as dependent on the Pākehā as what we are. Um, we are totally dependent. Whoops. There we go. That was frightening. Get the heart back. So where do the, entre the spirits are talking to you, see? Where do the entrepreneurs come from? And this is really interesting because this, this shows you a difference in lots of different things about Māori entrepreneurs and Aboriginal entrepreneurs. Uh, do the entrepreneurs come from the middle class or do they come from the poverty group? Bearing in mind that at around about statistically 20 years ago, more than half of our groups were in the, below the poverty level, uh, and I'm not sure of the current stats, but uh, more than half of our people were below the poverty level. And in Aboriginal Australia, it is still the same. We haven't increased. At a calculated guess, based on 720 formal interviews, in Australia, 70% of our entrepreneurs have come from the middle class area of Aboriginal Australia, which is roughly about 160,000 men, women and children. 30% come from the poverty area. They've been able to come out of the poverty gap, they've been able to claw their way up. Māori, it's the exact opposite. 30% have come from the middle class Māori, 70% have come from the poverty. And that shows you this incredible, um, this incredible drive, this fire in the belly that I'll talk about in a minute uh, that Māori have. Uh, and, the, and the opportunities they have because of their well-developed social networks. This is one of our brothers in Canada. I didn't use a picture of Aboriginal or Māori because I didn't want to offend, but this is where a lot of us have come from. We've come from the immense poverty of living on the streets, and we all know these stories because uh, that's why we hear social entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship can alleviate poverty if it is mentored and it is subject to some very bu simple basics. And one of them is our pride and our history. Now, if I told you that Aboriginal Australia has a, a site which is in Lake Conda in the western part of Victoria that is 8,000 years old. We had 8,000 years of entrepreneurship and enterprise there in an established aquaculture industry that fed up to 10,000 people, the Gunachamara people, stone homes, they were sedentary people, they operate under a chieftain system. 150 years ago the British came in, shot them all and, or shot most of them, and drained the lake for grazing. Um, and this, you know, we have a history, Māori have a history, but this history is not being taught in our schools and it's not given to our kids so they can have that strength and knowledge and pride in their culture. That is wrong. Um, what are and who are Indigenous entrepreneurs? This is both Māori and Aboriginal entrepreneurs. The Aboriginal, the Māori entrepreneur alters traditional patterns of behaviour by utilising their resources in the pursuit of self-determination, which is financial independence, and economic sustainability via entry into self-employment forcing social change. 
our interaction in the economy, in the wider on econ economy, is forcing simple, uh, social change. And it's in the pursuit of opportunity beyond the cultural norms of initial economic resources. Those cultural norms, and this is where I'm criticised by my uh, non-Aboriginal experts, the cultural norms of colonisation. We are breaking the norms of colonisation. If you think we are in a post-colonisation or post-structuralist or whatever you want to do, we are still within a colonising uh, economy and we are breaking out of that colonising economy by being successful entrepreneurs. That's the exciting thing. So what's changed in 20 years of research? What's unchanged is the hatred of poverty, often the result of a deprived childhood. There is a strong desire to provide for your children, to give them something you didn't have growing up. And in nine times out of ten, that's education. Is there a positivity to succeed? And this is the fire in the belly. Raymond Smiler, the theorist, talks about it. And a common quote that I hear both sides of the ditch, we must succeed, there is no alternative. And this is one of the, the incredibly empowering things for me as a researcher. And also the control of the lives. We have choices. As a successful entrepreneur, as an enterprise uh, person, you have choices in your life. And they saw this as self or they see this as self-determination. Unchanged, what attributes make? The family is identified as your dominant intrinsic motivator. It's a provision for the family. Also, entrepreneurs identify with contemporary urban indigenous values, which is changing all the time. We are changing. Our values are changing. Um, and, uh, and I could go on length and I'll get bogged down in, in uh, cultural issues and I'll get attacked because I'll say the wrong thing, so I won't talk about Māori. Um, but successful entrepreneurs also knew when and how to say no. This side of the ditch, it is said very politely and it is said with wonderful um, connection, but there's also a pride in someone being in business this side of the ditch. On the other side, there is a real problem with us. Um, we, are, we see someone in business and we automatically think they've got money and we try and pull them down and we try and take, you know, try and borrow and share, but we've forgotten what reciprocation is all about. This side of the ditch, you actually still remember what reciprocation is, and that's because of tikanga. You have, that value, you have a value system that we lost with colonisation. Unchanged is also the values, but the majority are still trying to, to uh, satisfy the basic philosophical and safety needs of health, housing and education. And that's still scary, that the majority of our entrepreneurs, whether they've come from middle class or from um, poverty levels, are still seeking for these same things. Unchanged is also the alignment with the dominant culture, which I mentioned at the start. Education in Australia, roughly around about 70%, 76% of our entrepreneurs actually have formal education or a high degree of TAFE qualifications and 10 to 20 years of experience. This side of the ditch, it's slightly lower. It's around about 60% uh, in the high 50s, 60%, and it's, that's more to do with the networking skills that are available here, which we don't have. Um, education does not give you the, the tools to be successful in business, but what it does do is give you some life skills and give you skills for communication, and that's what's uh, really important. Social capital and human capital is far better developed this side of the, of the ditch than, than in our country, and that's what I think as social, um, as social workers and, and social entrepreneurship people we should always be thinking of how we understand that, because government unfortunately do not understand it in government agencies. Also unchanged is the incredible networking skills that we find in Aotearoa um, and the reinvestment of funds in a business for capital growth and the human capital, which is the development of the children. Um, what has changed dramatically over the last 20 years as well is start-up capital. 20 years ago, the average start-up business here uh, was around about $5,000. Australia was about $6,000. 10 years ago, it jumped to $12,000. And now we're looking at it between twenty dollars and $200,000 for start-up capital. For the average person who's come from a poverty level, that's impossible. Where do you get it? Oops, gone too far. Where do you get it? You borrow it. Uh, 20 years ago, $2,000 in savings, $2,000 borrowed from mum or dad or, or uncle, um, and $2,000 in the old bank card. Nowadays, two visa accounts, that's $10,000, and you know, $10,000 from maybe a little bit from your savings or a bit from borrowings. But we are now borrowing more and more. So if you've got a start-up capital of 200000 I guarantee you, probably 195000 is probably borrowed. And that limits the success of your business because you're paying out all that interest. So be aware of that as well. And it's, it's changing, but the demands for our start-up capital has changed. What's unchanged is also the fact that we're married. 70% of us in Australia are married, entrepreneurs. 55% of those to non-Indigenous spouses. And I don't suggest you run out and marry a non-Indigenous spouse. But what it brings, and it's really scary, it brings to your business 
external capital, business finance, family capital and commercial human capital in, in skills and how to run a business. But basically from your start up, from your, the, the time you thought about the business to the time your business is successful, if it's all Indigenous, uh, that timeline is very long to, to, until you get to success. If you've got a non-Indigenous spouse, the timeline is much cl closer, it's much shorter. And that's what's uh, interesting. And that's uh, uh, a real um, negative approach to our, our uh, communities. Uh, and the attitudes of our banks, uh, and it highlights the disparity in social and business skills from the Indigenous to the non-Indigenous, and it also highlights the inflexible in blank bank lending criterion. In Australia, our bank lending is based on capital, credit worthiness, capacity to repay, character and credit history, as it is here. It's the misunderstanding of minorities that doesn't allow for any flexibility in the five Cs. Um, also, with a non-Indigenous spouse, there is a phenomenon that there is a knowledge of exit strategies. The majority of Māori and Aboriginal businesses, when you go in a business, you go in a business. You are not thinking about exit strategies. For some reason, a non-Indigenous person will have an exit strategy. They'll be thinking about that. They'll be thinking about a way out. Um, what's unchanged and the most scary thing, and being a fair-skinned, blue-eyed Aboriginal, I quite often get, get the experience of racism by seeing it and by hearing it, because non-Indigenous people soon forget that I'm Aboriginal. Discrimination, race-based and gender-based discrimination has not changed in 20 years. And that is the sad thing. It's so common, it's only acknowledged when it's physical or exclusionary. I am a resident in the, probably the most racist country in the world. And unfortunately, New Zealand, although it is slightly better, um, it is still hang your head and shame job. Uh, the greatest inhibited business and success in longevity in Australia, and to a lesser degree here, is this level of racism. Outside of tourism, many Aboriginal and I've found many um, Māori operators do not publicly identify because of the negativity with the racism that kicks back. <laughs> Typically, if you're a successful entrepreneur, uh, people will say to you, oh, you got off the government or you got a handout, that sort of thing, which is exactly the opposite of the truth. But racism is, um, is scary. What has changed, and this is where I'm really proud, things have changed dramatically. The capacity building, the skills development, the societal, social capital development, the networking skills, the education and the hunger, the drive to be successful. And what makes an Indigenous entrepreneur different from the rest of society? Uh, Sanatata Love. Uh, they have management control, responsibility and accountability, limited cultural practices applied in the business environment, which is hindered by racism. There can be obligations to extended family group. Um, the organisation offers as an ethos that mirrors the broader aspirations of Aboriginal success, both the Māori worldview and Aboriginal concepts. Um, do Indigenous entrepreneurs face different challenges to that experienced by settler society? You betcha. We face them every day of the week. What's changed? Access to money. I won't go into IBA. IBA is a government department or semi-government department that's arisen. It's, um, it's changed its attitude, but we also now have a government department trying to be a bank in Australia and it'll take them time, but they're really trying hard. They've got a vision, they've got programs. They're not the lender for everyone, but they are a lender. They take six months to, to approve 10,000 or 10 million. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're hamstrung by their bureaucracy, but we now have a lending source, a, a, you know, without the banks. But what's really exciting in Australia, and this is where I can see the development, is probably the only thing we've jumped ahead of uh, Aotearoa. I'm a, I'm a director on Mandura, Hunter Indigenous Business Chamber. We have an Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce set up in the Newcastle Valley, in the Hunter Valley. Um, we now have a New South Wales Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, which we've set up, which is solely Indigenous businesses. Uh, our CEO is Debbie Barwick, worked long and hard, Aboriginal woman, and but we now have these organisations, grassroots organisations, at that, uh, and we all know in social enterprise, if it's top down, it don't work. If it's bottom down, it works. These are bottom down organisations. But we also have the, uh, the Indigenous Business Network, South East Queensland, Charlie Jire on the right, Neil Wilmot on the left. I've got Neil's name there because I always forget it. Uh, and they're the, the South East Queensland Indigenous Chamber of Commerce as well. These guys are really going somewhere. They're like us. They're just as successful as us in New South Wales. Victoria, we now have Kinaway, the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce. And in Western Australia, we have the Pilbara Aboriginal Contractors Association, which is like another Chamber of Commerce. So it means all the contractors, all the Aboriginal businesses in the Pilbara are now linked together in a single voice. And out of a lot of that, we now have a national body, the Indigenous Business Council of Australia. Exciting stuff. We have a voice to Canberra. We have a, a united voice. Uh, the polys talk against us, but anyway. But we also have this wonderful lady, Natalie Walker, the Chief uh, Executive Officer of AMC. Um, AMC is pronounced AMC, is the Australian Indigenous Minority Supplier Council. 
Now, this is a spin-off of the SBA, the Small Business Authority in America, but it provides a direct business-to-business -business purchasing link between corporate Australia, government agencies and Indigenous-owned businesses. In other words, if government is dealing with a contract, they have to have an Indigenous business involved in that contract, and this is the way we do it. And even people like Rio Tinto, BHP, the big mining companies, uh, Westpac, uh, and on it goes, they all deal with AMSI. And we, we now have Indigenous business people involved in the big contracts. That's exciting stuff. We now have a link. There's an incredible future about capacity building and partnership for Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, I'm getting a wind up here. But we need to look at long-term planning. This isn't going to happen over a three or a five-year program, which politicians give us all the time. It's got to happen over 50 or 100-year programs. We need societal re-education about racism and sexism. And we, more importantly, we need inclusion of entrepreneurial ex education in our youth before grade nine, before we lose them out of high school. We've got to have that. Thank you. And one of the most exciting, and this is my last slide, and this is the most exciting slide. 20 years ago, I would never be able to pull up a heap of names just like that and put on a website or put on a, a screen like this. This is just a few of the Indigenous businesses in uh, Newcastle. And I could have several slides of these. Uh, because 20 years ago I'd have to go through protocol ethics and I'd have to ask people. Now these are in the public domain and this is the exciting thing that we now have businesses up there established on the web and, um, and actually I think we probably learned that off Māori but uh, we're both getting better and better at this that we can pull down this. So uh, what's changed? Our emancipation through enterprise. We are really going somewhere. When we can be financially independent we will have self-determination and until then we won't have it. Uh, and this is the challenge of us dealing within this dominant culture. Digeregor Nagalia, Yanu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we have actually the space for a couple of questions, maybe three or four questions, and I'm having to run the entire length of the building. So if you have a question for both or either of our um, panellists, please give us a yell. Yo, okay. can I, Peter. Can I, is this on? I just wanted to say at this point, because we have been talking about the role of, of government, I'd just like to uh, mihi to you to for being here as one of our Māori MPs out west. And, oh, materia, kia ora, thank you, uh, because it is the representation of government, uh, whether you're in or out of uh, power, at events like this. That So I'm sorry if there are any other MPs here that I've missed. Um, but, yeah, mihi, mihi kia kōrua for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, kia ora, kia ora tato katoa, and um, thank you for a really, really inspiring presentation. Salo for lava. Uh, I'm very interested in the fact that in the OECD, Māori are the third most enterprising um, people, and particularly in, in particular Māori women. I'd like you to say some more about that, Ella. Well, actually, interesting you should ask that, because that, st <laughs> that, that statistic was uh, derived from a piece of research was, which I was very fortunate to be involved with, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Now, the last time that that research was done in this country, and I'd like you to listen to this tone, Materia, <clears throat> was um, it, because it requires government funding to conduct that. Now, for some reason, somebody in Wellington has decided that the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is not going to be the preferred research strategy for exploring and measuring entrepreneurship in each country. There is, in fact, an OECD project which New Zealand ascribes to, which apparently we've been paying money into since 2005. I've never seen any research from them. I've never heard of them talking to any Māori, which at least the GEM research did. I don't know if that data is still robust because uh, nobody in government has allowed or funded that research to be done again. So if anybody is out there that has any sway, um, would like to see that research replicated because we don't know if the interventions that have occurred in the last eight years have actually had an impact. But certainly the data was collected in 2001 and 2005. And, and, and uh, you know, what we did was we just asked people. I know this sounds like rocket science, but we just rang people up and said, oh, two, are you fellas going to start a business? And believe it or not, lots of them said yes. Now, that does not mean that that business would be successful. What we were trying to capture was entrepreneurial intentions because you can have all the government policies you like to stimulate innovation, but if you do not have people with entrepreneurial intentions, 
those initiatives are going to fall flat on their face. So it's meshing entrepreneurial intention with community and governmental support that I think truly underpins innovation and enterprise. It's the relationship between the two. So I would like to see that research. I don't necessarily think that I'll be part of it, but I'd like to see a project like that um, being replicated again and focusing not just actually on Māori business, but, but all New Zealanders figured high entrepreneurially in the GEM project. But we've never really looked at Pacifica entrepreneurship. We've never really looked at migrant entrepreneurship. But I live in the Dale. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's required, I'm sorry. Um, and, and, you know, if, sorry, Dean. Um, every, every Sunday, 100,000 people invade my suburban park in my driveway. Um, and, and the vast majority of those small micro entrepreneurs that you will find at Avondale Market, one of our little tourist spots, uh, are frequently Māori Pacifica and new, new migrants, new New Zealanders. So, you know, how do we measure that level of entrepreneurial intention and then support it to develop and, and really empower their community? So thank you for the question. Any, any other questions? I have one of them. I want to ask one. Um, one of our focuses has been around um, organisations that are uh, mandated directly by their community. And I mean, one of the th growth areas that we've seen over the last 20 odd years is the iwi organisations. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what occurs in, um, in Australia. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the tensions of entrepreneurship and the individual and them working within an organisation uh, which is going through you know, obviously a treaty process. Uh, and then how does it invest in those entrepreneurs? Mm. I think Dennis has got a view as well, but certainly I am of the view that, um, well, first and foremost, I need to say that I am of the view that iwi is a bit of a post-colonial construction. If you go back and look at the Declaration, and uh, 1835 and the Treaty, 1840, you know, you see that we as a people saw ourselves as hapu and that part of the colonisation process was, uh, you know, concertinaing large cohorts of tribes into manageable corporate bodies. Uh, and certainly legislation like the Iwi Runanga Act of 1989, where, where you know, Māori groups rushed to form Iwi Runanga, and then when the legislation went away, meant that we were left with these corporate entities, has meant that we as a people are still struggling with our iwi identity and the role that iwi has in economic development. Having said that, there are some very successful iwi around the country who I think are doing exemplary work, and I salute their work. But internally, and as I'm part of Ngāpuhi, uh, we're still having those struggles. This is a work in progress. I don't think you unpick the impacts of 170 years of colonisation in two electoral cycles or even five electoral cycles. The, what I'm heartened by is that Māori communities are actually having that discussion. We're wrestling with the tensions. We are struggling with how we uh, deal with the fact that the vast majority of iwi are in fact represented outside of their communities. Um, but those, are, those I think, are, are positive struggles. They are things that we are engaged in ourselves that are an important part of our future development. You know, I have um, still relatives in the north who see me as a traitor because I, I left, or we were part of that community that left. But as I say to my cousin, say, bro, if I went home, I'd take your job because I'm smarter than you. <laughs> you know, you're better off leaving me in Auckland. <laughs> Wherever I am, that's where the empire stops. <laughs> and we now... <laughs> We now have the technology so that our whānau in Sydney mm -hmm. and London and New York are part of a cyber iwi, and maybe that's the way we start thinking about our identity in the future. Anyway. Um, yeah, just to answer the question from an Australian point of view, one of the, the, the great differences between Aboriginal and Māori is that in the Aboriginal community concept, yeah, the Aboriginal community uh, enterprise uh, fails and it fails because of two reasons. One is because there's no personal capital investment, and also there's a shared um, a shared uh, responsibility. So there's no one individual person who's responsible. So therefore, it's easy to opt out on things. And the government models of funding have failed in those areas um, because of that no capital investment, and then the shared no shared responsibility, no individual responsibility. Um, so very few have survived and, and have, have been successful at all. So really, uh, within our side, the, um, the societal pressures, it's the individual entrepreneur that has a much higher success rate. And I argue all, 
all the day that all day long that an individual entrepreneur the impact that they have on the immediate family and then within a short period of time five ten years uh, on their secondary family it's far more effective than it, had, it would have had it been a, a community organization that was floundering yeah thank you oh kim's got a question you have to be quick kim go for it shout it out because people won't be able to hear go for it So the question was around the urban Māori movement. Yeah. Um, like I said, you know, iwi are still evolving our, the role of iwi in economic development and the reality, and I'll just use Ngāpuhi, you know, we have over 120,000 people at the last census who said they were Ngāpuhi, um, but the reality is the majority of Ngāpuhi live in Auckland. Um, so there's a tribe that is wrestling with how it maintains its relationships with the Taurahere, um, but also allows those urban groups to form new identities. And, and, you know, I don't know how many of you have lived in Auckland for a long time, but the reality is Auckland is not a city. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group of villages. And, and, you know, if you're Tat North, you're Tat North. You know, if you're Otahuhu, you're Otahuhu. And that's not too distinct from the urban Māori communities. So we're all wrestling with how we live together. Um, but certainly organisations like Waipareira, I think, as one of the early precursors to uh, Māori urban development, have played a pivotal role in the evolution of our recognition that there is an important place for NGOs like Waipareira, not just to deliver social services, but also to raise the identity of the place. I mean, West Auckland has had an identity that's transcended three restructurings of city councils because of organisations like Waipareira. So I think they play a pivotal social as well as economic role. But it is, I believe, still evolving. I don't know that that answers your question terribly well, but I don't know the answer, Al. I think that one of the things you have done is you've opened our eyes to another aspect and another way of looking at entrepreneurial activity. And um, one, I think one of our interesting challenges going forward is going to be how do we, uh, those communities of interest, and recognising those multiple communities of interest, and that identity is an incredible part of that. You know, and tikanga and values. And we opened earlier, uh, you might remember yesterday, the strong ideas of values and tikanga um, being able to hold uh, a space for entrepreneurial activity. We're going to be moving on to our politics and our lunchbox and lunchtime now, but please would you give a great warm thanks to Dennis and Mella.